I have already done a lesson on, or a video I should say, on um, women being in ministry and how I advocate that, and I think the Bible advocates that too. Um, so I'm not going to look too much at that. Um, but there obviously seems to be like a progression if you look at things um, in, the, in the Bible, in our historical context, where, thing, where it's like God's trying to push people more towards a certain um, outcome. And so I think that's important. And so we're going to look at today, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15. Now, before we do, I do want to recommend some books um, for you. Um, obviously, there's a lot of people with a lot of views on this. So um, I'm not trying to um, demonize certain people. I'm not trying to demonize certain denominations. I'm just saying we need to have the dialogue open because sometimes people make mistakes. And, you know, sometimes things need to be corrected. And... So, uh, the the first is this, From Pentecost to Patmos. It's by Craig Blomberg. Uh, he's one of my favorites, so I'm a little bit biased. I always recommend his books. And then the second one um, is this one. I haven't read a whole lot of it, and I don't necessarily agree with everything, but I think that she's definitely on the right track. So what we need to do is we need to remember that the Bible is a historical document. And whenever you're studying history, you always want to consider the context uh, because things change. Uh, so this book is called Paul and Gender. Sorry, there's a glare there. Paul and Gender. It's by Cynthia Westfall. Um, what I have read of it, I, I, I'm greatly enjoying. I would definitely want to recommend that, that to you. Um, but uh, for this, we'll mostly be looking at the text itself. Um, so let's start with 1 Timothy 2, 11-15. And it says, this is from the NIV. Um, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and become a sinner, became a sinner. Uh, but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. So here we have obviously the first problem is that we're looking back 2,000 years after this was written. And there's a lot of people with a lot of, a lot of opinions. And there's a lot of... Um, Stuff that's happened in between. So to pick up here and even den trying to deny that you are carrying this this baggage with you is very difficult. I mean, we all like to think that we're thinking perfectly clear, but the truth is all of us are, are impacted by what has happened in history. And so now we're trying to look at this with fresh vision and say, okay, what is the text actually trying to say? And so let's look at that. Okay, first off, let's look at the structure of the of the section itself, and that's what we like to call a chiasm. Now, it's called a chiasm because in Greek, uh, the letter, it, it looks like an X. It's it's pronounced uh, key. Also, it's pronounced sometimes uh, chi, you know, whatever. Um, some people say chi, whatever, uh, just that you know what I'm talking about. And either way, it looks like an X. And so the idea is that it ha whatever's being written uh, will have two outline points that connect with each other and then... Um, another two things that connect, and then another two things, and then in the middle will be the main point of the passage. And so when looking at chiasm, there's highlighting a, a central point. So let, let's look at that. Um, you have this. A woman should learn. That's how it starts in 11. And if you hop down to 14, that's how it ends. Adam was not deceived. So a woman should learn because she was deceived. I do not permit a woman to teach because Adam was formed first. So he's talking about structure here. And then the middle point, the main point of, of 2, um, 11 through 14, is that the woman must be quiet. But if you look at the context and at the word itself, it doesn't actually mean silence. Nor does the rest of the Bible talk about being quiet. So it's more talking about being respectful. So if, her, if the main point of this whole passage is, is that women, whoever these women are, if it's for all time or for the occasion, let's hold on and put a pin in that, um, Whoever these women are, they women must be uh, uh, respectful. Okay, well, if you look at the big picture that people have said this passage is about, definitely, women not being in leadership. Well, what does that necessarily have to do with women being respectful? So it, you have a little bit of a problem there with trying to... It doesn't fit naturally. It seems like we're trying to force a conclusion that maybe wasn't there. And all I'm saying is we need to... We need to be asking the hard questions. We need to keep looking at the Bible, but because the instant that you think you know everything is the very instant that you don't know everything. Uh, okay, so the main point in this whole section is that women should be respectful. 
Okay, all right, I can roll with this. Now, now let's let's look at it a little bit further and realize that this statement that Paul says actually isn't true. You know, he says very clearly in verse uh, 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. But we know that that's not, not true. Uh, for instance, in Acts 18.26, it says Priscilla and Aquila. Now, these are two Jews, a husband and wife, who came from uh, Jerusalem. What had happened was the emperor kicked out all the Jews in Rome because of it's – it's a, it's, a, it's a whole thing. But either way, um, so they end up um, in, uh, in this place over here, you know, away from Rome. And that's actually where Paul runs into them. And so through the course of time, there's this guy who's preaching. And it says that Priscilla and Aquila uh, heard him talk. And so they went up and pulled him aside and, and showed him the things of God more accurately. Now, in Greek, it has a way of highlighting um, things that it wants to relay or maybe even people that are more dominant. In this case, it puts the wife's name first implying that she was the one who's actually doing the things and he was the husband was just maybe just there uh, or if he did contribute to the to the teaching it was in a more minor role she was the one who had the primary role um, so here we have a woman clearly teaching a man and nothing in acts tells us that it's wrong so we have a little bit of a problem now there are other examples in the bible too of women taking the taking the lead roles or teaching and so we have a little bit of a little bit of a problem because that would mean that the Bible is contradicting itself. Now, some people just get around this by saying, "Yes, the Bible does contradict itself; it's not true." Other people try and mix and match and just kind of pick and choose. You know, I want the Bible to be true, but I don't want to face the hard reality that what it just said was not true unless I'm misinterpreting it. Now, that is a very real possibility. So let's look at the the passage itself and how I believe people are mistranslating. First off, the Greek word clearly changed from changes from women to a woman. Now, why would Paul do that? Well, I believe, now, the word translated woman and wife and husband and uh, man are the same word. Same word. So Paul could definitely be talking about husbands and wives or man and woman. The question is, which did he assume? I mean, which one did he intend? So if you look at the structure itself, he starts out in verse 8 by talking about men everywhere pray lifting up holy hands. So we're not talking about what's going on in the church. We're talking about men everywhere. Okay. Then we go down to verse 9. I also want the women to dress modestly. Okay, so now he's talking about how women shouldn't try to turn heads. They shouldn't try to, um, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, they should be modest. That kind. Of, okay, all right. That's also not confined to the realm of church. He's saying, I want men everywhere. And then he said, I want women. Now we get to verse 11. He says, a woman. And people instantly say, no, that shouldn't be translated as a wife, which makes more sense. He's talking about women, men and women broadly than married life. And then he goes to leadership. He's, a, he's going from the broader to the more specific. Husband and wife. I'm sorry, man and woman in verses 8 through 10. Husband and wife in verses 9 through 11. Or, I'm sorry, uh, verses 11 through 4, 15. Sorry, I said that wrong. And then in chapter 3, he talks about leadership. It's clearly a, a progression from the broader to the more refined. But if we argue that it should be translated as woman, you lose a lot of the structure that Paul is establishing here, and you have a book that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and things that just kind of seem like they're thrown in there. Not only that, but it also contradicts other parts of the Bible. So maybe Paul was just teaching his own gospel in his own way, and maybe Paul was sexist, and the church was meant to be sexist, and it's just the one that, the, the, um, the view that won. But that's not really likely either, and that's a whole different conversation itself, but there's really no reason to assume something so drastic. Um, so that takes us to, to the problem. So what, how should this be translated? Well, if we assume it's from broader to more refined, that actually makes sense if he goes man and woman, husband and wife, leadership. Okay, all right. Um, hmm, okay. So if you look at the different things he's saying, a woman should learn quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. Now, see, that just makes more sense if we assume that he's talking about husband and wife. And that would also explain why he changes the Greek form to show that he's not talking about men and women broadly, but specifically a wife and a husband. A wife should learn quietness and full submission. Ah, well, here we go. Now we've got, like, a clear progression of thought here. Excuse me. 
Um, and then we look at, well, what's his example for why he thinks this? He pulls out the, uh, he pulls out a husband and wife. His example is of a husband and wife. And then the, um, the, f the final nail in the coffin for why I think it's a husband and wife and not a man and woman more broadly is because in verse 15 he talks about childbearing. But we know that childbearing is for marriage from other things that Paul has said and other things that the Bible has said. So with that in mind, his examples are of a husband and wife. Childbearing is for a husband and wife. Uh, it follows the the, stru the structure of the book, and the Greek seems to be implying that he's switching from broad to more specific. So that seems to imply that he's talking about marriage. So the question we need to ask is not what have I heard, what has my what has my church taught me, what is uh, what have people commonly believed. The question should always be what is the context of this passage, because to remove a historical book from its context and just blindly latch on to anything because you think you understand it is completely wrong. That's not how you look at history. History is about getting in their heads, finding out what they meant. Now, the Bible can be used for any number of things. It can both condone and condemn slavery, uh, spousal abuse, rape. I mean, all kinds of different things. So clearly the question isn't, can I make the Bible say this, but do, is, did the Bible intend to say this? There's a big difference there. So Obviously, 1 Timothy is very context-driven if you've ever read through 1 Timothy. Obviously, it's context-driven. The question is, what context? What was the context? Now, we'll look at that in just a second. There's no reason to assume he's talking about church structure in verses 11 through 15. See, we're, okay, so he's talking about men everywhere and women everywhere, and then we get to verse 11 and we freeze up. So he's talking about women everywhere for all time in the context, in the context of a church service. What? Or a church leadership, either, either or. That doesn't make sense. It also doesn't fit um, Paul's writing style or the rest of the book or the rest of the Bible. It just doesn't seem to fit. So then we have to ask ourselves, is there a different way to look at this passage that maybe seems a little bit more natural to what Paul meant? Obviously, we can't talk to Paul, but we can look at it like that. So... Um, it, it, the first thing we need to realize is that in verse 11 he says a woman should learn right there. That should catch our attention because society wasn't exactly fair, um, especially in the Jewish world. It was a little bit better in more of the uh, Greek world and that kind of stuff. But there was definitely still problems that did exist there um, with equality and different stuff and with cultural views and different stuff. And remember that each different city might have a whole different way of looking at things. So these are all important uh, points. And so his first thing that seems a little bit like a, a side thing is instead of just pushing women to the side and focusing on the men, he calls the women to be brought forth center here, front, or front center in, in, in this context. A woman should learn. Oh. Well, that's different. That also seems to take us back to, if you remember the chiasm, where I was talking about with the main point being the woman, the woman being respectful. Well, if you are including her and teaching her, that's good, but as she's learning, she should be respectful. Okay, well, this is actually making sense. So you've got women who need to be instructed, and while they're being instructed, they should be respectful. This is, this is something that applies that applies to us all the way down to now. If someone's teaching you, if you're going through a training, do you disrespect your, your trainer? Do you go to the gym and, and constantly tell your gym, your your whoever's teaching you, whoever's training you, your trainer? Do you constantly pretend like you know more than them? Do you constantly argue with them on everything that they say? Or do you listen and then you do what they say? There's clearly an authority structure that exists in gyms. So how much more should there not be just chaos in the context of a church? This is making sense. Let's keep going. Um, so, but then if we remember that it's chiasm, we'll note, we'll note that the points um, relate to each other. So I do not per permit a woman to teach because Adam was formed first. And a woman should learn. Why? Because Adam was not deceived. Okay, so let's let's look at this. Now, I know this might seem a little bit confusing. Just stick with me. Okay, so I, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission because, hop down to verse 14, Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. So in other words, when, wives, which is the translation I think is more accurate, 
of course you have to hop over years and years of, of, of English translations and, and, and church structure and male dominance and that kind of stuff but let's look let's think let's consider this if if we can get past the Crusades and say the church should not be mili mili militaristic military driven um, then maybe we can also look at the role of women and say maybe they messed up in other areas too and maybe we're just holding on to this archaic belief not because of what the Bible says but because it's uncomfortable for us and the Bible has a lot of things that are uncomfortable like for instance not pursuing the love of money a lot of American Christians don't want to don't want to they just want to ignore that point it's fine it's fine but the truth is for the first 300 years of the church's existence it was mostly poor people there were a few rich people here and there but not really um, in fact, the ones in Acts, they're the exception to the rule, not the rule. There were all these rich people that got saved, and what did they do with their wealth? They gave it to the church. And that's why it was such a big deal, is because the majority of the church was poor. So the wives should learn, because Eve sinned by being de de deceived. And in the same way, our wives will sin by being deceived too. So let's let them learn so that they won't be deceived. Now that makes sense. Now once again, the context here is that they were having wives who were being deceived. And just like Adam went along with Eve's sin, so husbands go along with their wife's sin. So we have to make sure that the, the deception stops, that the draw a line in the sand. So once again, this is something that makes sense. And if you look at the context, this is actually something that kind of applies as now beyond husband and wife too. We need to make sure we aren't deceived. I mean, this is just making sense. So now let's look at the next part. Verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. Now, some people have said this is this, he's talking about something negative, like um, um, being dominating or being tyrannical over the man. There's no really re there's no real reason to assume that. Um, this kind of Greek structure is either two positive things, the good thing or the good thing, or two negative things, bad thing or bad thing. And there's no reason to assume that um, teaching is negative in this context or in the word itself, and so assume authority shouldn't be as translated as a negative idea. There, it's it's how the Greek structure works, most most probably two good things or two bad things. So he's not talking about women being over dominating or wives being over dominating. Um, I do not permit a wife to teach or to assume authority over a man. Why? Well, verse thirteen. Why, uh, wives should not be should not should not. I misspelled that. Sorry. Wives should not take the primary role of spiritual leadership because Adam was formed first. In other words, what he's saying is God established a pattern for um, for the, uh, a Christian family structure. And in that Christian family structure, he established the man to be um, the spiritual leader. Well, now, you have to stop and you have to ask, now, what does that mean? Now, we know, ki we know wives, can, wives can teach kids, and husbands can teach kids. That's something that they both can do. So that brings us to the question of, so what what was he meaning here? What what does it mean that does that mean that a husband can make all the calls? No. It also doesn't mean that the wife doesn't have a voice. He's talking about a specific situation. You can tell that by what he says in verse 15. Now, hold on a second, okay? So, let your wives learn. Although you should probably learn respectfully. That sounds like a good idea. And they should not be teaching the husbands because Adam was formed first. Well, okay, all right. So let's let's kind of wait to draw any firm conclusions. Let's let's keep plowing ahead. Um, ugh, sorry, it messed up. My PowerPoint's been giving me problems, and I won't do it in order. Anyways, um, so then that brings us to the to the big question that people just kind of seem to ignore. How does two fifteen fit? Obviously, there's a chiasm. Obviously, there's a chiasm in eleven through fourteen. Obviously, there's a progression. From single to married to, to, to church. Obviously, there's a progression here. Excuse me. So the question becomes, how does 215 fit at all? Some people have said, okay, he's saying that you have to, the only way for you to be saved is by having kids. What? No, salvation is only through Jesus Christ. Well, maybe he's saying that women should have roles in the house and that has to be good for them. That can't be true, because the rest of the Bible shows a lot of examples of women not doing that. For instance, Priscilla and Aquila, another great example. Uh, Deborah in the book of Judges. Uh, Miriam in the book of Exodus. Or, yeah, Exodus. We have a lot of women leaders who are, are not staying put in their houses. None of that. 
But that's expecting something that women weren't even expected to do back then. Obviously, Jews had more of a, a focus on family structure than Romans and Greeks, but still, to say, yes, this is definitely what it means, wives should stay put in their house and have kids and just tend to the affairs of the house, that is not historical, and that is obviously sexist, and you're looking back and adding something into the story that wasn't meant to be there. So next up, the more obvious translations here is that Wives will uh, will not lose their salvation by having children. Now, this is given warranted and, and given warrant in another part of First Timothy chapter four, verse three. It gives us a glimpse of some of the heresies that are going around. And he says they forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. So the first part there, th there's a heresy going around that is preventing people from being married. Now, obviously, we can say we can kind of look into this and say there was probably some hesitancy to have children then if if being married was being taught as a bad thing. And it, obviously it seems like th some of these heresies were going around the leadership too because Paul spends a lot of, a lot more time in, uh, on leadership points in 1 Timothy than he does in Titus, which was written right around the same time. But then also there's another aspect to this whole thing and that's that uh, 1 Timothy was written to the city of Ephesus. Now in Ephesus they had a, a patron god whose name was Artemis or I think the other name was Diana, depending on Roman or Greek. Um, and that was the god of uh, fertility and that kind of stuff. So if you were pregnant or wanted to become pregnant, you would pray to Artemis. Now he's writing to people who used to be pagans, who used to be into that mindset. And obviously there's, there's a select group of Greek or Roman women who are rich and who are trying to um, get the attention on them and that kind of stuff, which we can very clearly see in verse 9. Um, Chapter two, verse nine. Uh, so that's obviously a thing. So we know that that the, some of the some of their history is kind of conflicting with their new personality. Um, so we have two. He's saying clearly saying, uh, implying two different things. First off, uh, trust in God for your pregnancies, and but more importantly, he seems to be saying that you aren't going to lose your salvation by becoming pregnant. Because once again, if they're teaching abstinence from sexual relationships, well, then it's clearly important to say this. And so then the question once again becomes, how does 2.15 fit into 2.11 through 14? Well, if you translate it husband and wife, I mean man and woman, it really doesn't fit at all. It seems like almost like a side note. And once you take into, into, into point the chiasm, it very clearly doesn't fit. But if you take the model that I just said, it's very obviously saying this. You should be teaching your wives because they're they're getting deceived. Okay. Now I don't want these wives to be teaching the husbands because that we just need to establish order here. And this is Paul's way of preventing the heresy from going any further. Teach them. There's a problem here, so you need to teach them. That's that's his first step. Okay. Now establishing structure. That's his second step to overcoming heresy, and that actually fits with the book of Timothy. If you look throughout First Timothy. Paul is establishing structure. So if he's establishing structure with Timothy and with the church, why shouldn't he establish church, uh, uh, authority structure with the house too? Paul's purpose is to combat the heresy that's going crazy, and he does it in two ways. Teach the women so that they'll stop being deceived, because evidently these women were the ones being deceived. And once again, context-driven, what was happening at this church at this time. And the second problem is that there was just, it was chaotic. There were no leaders. And so now Paul's saying, okay, let's just, let's fix this. Leadership established, leadership established, leadership established, teach. He even tells Timothy this. He says, now, hold closely onto these things. Hold closely to the teachings. Be ready in, in season, out of season. He, he says a lot of things in these, first and second Timothy both. Um, don't know what that was. Um <clears throat> So where was I? Okay, so that makes more sense. Now we've got, this is what 2.15 is saying. Women will not lose their salvation by having children, obviously assuming that they continue in the faith, which, which if you look at 2.15, that's exactly what he says. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. That's the very signs of, of, of uh, salvation. Um, faith. How can you be saved without faith? Uh, love. The whole the whole law is, is summarized in the, in the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. 
and love God. Um, sorry, I thought God does in reverse order. Um, and then this third thing, and holiness. The whole Christian life is about abstaining from the immorality of the world. He's summarizing Christianity. So if we look at it like this, now we have a clear structure. It makes sense. It connects with the rest of the book. And so now we can ask the question honestly. Honestly, does it make more sense to translate it as husband and wife and divorce it? I mean, sorry, and, and, and where it fits or to translate it as man and woman where it doesn't fit and divorce it from all, the whole context of the book? Which one is more natural? And I think that if you're honest, you'll see that the more natural translation is husband and wife, not man and woman. So the book of Timothy was written to a church which is obviously struggling with heresy and poor leadership. So that should be considered in everything that Paul is saying. Part of the teaching, notice that he never once said that I never allow women in any context to teach in, in anything. He says, I do not permit a wife to teach her to assume the authority over a man. I establish this structure for the marriage. Why? Why that, Paul? Why do you establish that, that kind of structure for, for the house? Why shouldn't it be whichever one is stronger spiritually? Because Adam was formed first. In other words, I establish this because God established this at creation. This is something that cannot change. So now we have to wade through that because people don't hear what I just said. People hear this. Women have to be subjected to men. That's not what I said at all. Just because a, a husband is tasked with, with that does not mean that the wife does not have equal say. Does not mean that the wife is equal. Doesn't mean that the man should also be responsible for ta for the jobs and the chores around the house, and should also be responsible for children. It also does not mean that a husband gets his way just because he says it. It doesn't mean any of those things. It doesn't mean that the wife cannot work. It doesn't mean that the wife cannot leave the house. It doesn't mean that the wife can only have kids. It doesn't mean any of that. What it does mean is that the husband is responsible for rooting out the heresy in the, in the family structure. He is responsible for establishing the spiritual authority, just like Christ did. We have God the Father, Jesus, leadership in the church, the body of the church. Jesus himself established an authority structure. Even the Trinity uh, works in this kind of way. God sent the Son, or the Father sent the Son, the Son sent the Spirit. There is a clear progression there. That's how God does things. And if God does it in every other area of life, why wouldn't he do it in the confines of marriage? Why wouldn't he do that? So now we have a clear... And here's the thing. By having healthy families, that will, result, that will make a healthy church. The church is made up of individuals. So, part of the teaching that husbands should be giving their wives is concerning absence of sexual relationships. They should be teaching that that's not what God teaches. And... Now we have a clear, a clear thing here. Okay, so he's saying uh, husbands should be teaching their wives. The wives should not be teaching their husbands. Uh, in this, obviously, it's not wrong for your wife to tell you, hey, I learned this, or something like that, or hey, um, God wanted me to tell you this. It's not wrong for that. I mean, come climb down off your, off your high horse. He's talking about in the more authoritative, authoritative structure, um, structure of a man establishing a spiritual authority structure in the house. In other words, when the, when the husband's out of the house, the wife should not take it on herself to get the kids to go against um, what the father said. Does that make sense? Obviously, the husband shouldn't do the same thing. Obviously. Obviously. But traditionally, traditional household structures has consisted of the husband going off to work. In modern days, that structure has changed a lot. So we have to look at it a little bit differently. But still, the principle remains the same, that men and women should both be allowed to learn and that there should be an authority structure in the household. So, um, there, you will always bump heads with your spouse if there is not a clear authority structure. That, that is just a fact. And see, this, this is difficult because that involves the husband laying down himself and doing everything for his wife, for his wife's best interest, even to the point of death. And that in, involves a wife humbling herself to follow along with a, a man who is often stubborn and one-sided. So both are having to do something that's outside of their um, natural orientation. A husband and wife just, they don't like to do that. They, they people, people butt heads. Husband and wives 
they're not compatible. Men and women are not compatible. They don't think alike. They don't act alike. Nothing about them is like. But in that, in that, in that weakness, is the strength. See, the husband and the wife need each other because they can't do it by themselves. Because they're not. They're different people. A husband is like this. A wife is like this. Well, you put two of them together, and the two become one flesh, and they're able to resolve the issue because they don't think alike. That diversity is exactly what, what, what God intended. Male and female, he created them. He created them to be different. So, um, okay, so now Paul's saying, but, at, okay, so 11 through 14, okay, so, so instruct, okay, all right, but women, wives, okay, guys, you will be preserved through through childbearing. In other words, you go go ahead and teach them. But let me just go ahead and kick the kickstart this thing. Before you before husbands before you ever even get to your wives, let me just preface whatever uh, discussions you guys have with this. You will be preserved through through your childbearing. You are not going to lose your salvation because you're married or because you have kids. You don't have to abstain from sex. So, um, <clears throat> no reason to assume that this is always applies. Okay, there's no reason to assume that everything that he's saying here always applies for all eternity. But apparently, husbands were always meant not to dictate, but to lead spiritually. So I think that's important. There is always going to be a structure, and the problem is, is a lot of times men go to this extreme and act like tyrants. I have the last say. I'm the head of the household, and the wife is pushed to this extreme, or they go to this extreme and just let complete chaos ensue in their house. Well, neither is biblical. And then last, uh, and we just want to point out a few rebuttals. Some people say it shouldn't be translated husband and wife. Why? Why shouldn't it be translated husband and wife? I've given a clear, um, clear argument as to why it should be translated husband and wife. So if it is not translated husband and wife, then what is the flow of the passage? And how does it fit in with the rest of the book? And how does it adequately uh, resolve Paul's main themes? So you, you have to answer these questions, and then you have to look at them and say, which view makes more sense? Women can't talk in churches. Women should be quiet in churches. That's actually not true. First Corinthians, for instance, talks about how they would be uh, prophesying in a church, how they would be praying in a church context. So <laughs> you have a heck of a hard time trying to say, hey, this is how it is when the Bible says that that's not how it is. Women can't teach. That's also not true. Once again, I could give other examples, but let's focus on the example I already gave. Priscilla clearly taught. Well, that wasn't in the context of a church. They really didn't have the clear, and this is a point that I'm going to bring up here in a minute, they didn't have that distinction between in the church and out of the church. They were the church, not a building. Now let me come back to that, okay? Women can't lead. Well, that's also not true. As in chapter 3, verse 1, it clearly says, if anyone desires to teach. And some people say it, that, that that word is masculine, so it should be translated as if any man. Actually, that's not true. See, the Bible oftentimes says, um, where Paul says, so then I write, my dear brothers. Well, that's a way of saying the church. But he only uses the one ver and the one word, which is why some of the new translations say my brothers and sisters, because that's kind of we talk differently now. But it's kinda, he's Paul is saying that he's saying all y'all. He's not saying men only. Um, especially since nowadays, for instance, where women outnumber men in, in most churches. So. His words were written to less than half of the modern congregation. See, I mean, you, you, you can't <laughs> you can't pick and choose what parts of the Bible you want to believe for your own point of view. Uh, Huster Gonzalez, um, kind of you know the guy about uh, church history, uh, wrote in his uh, story of Christianity um, that women were more um, confined as heresy went further and as the church went further and as the church became more imperialized. In other words, there's no reason to assume that the early church didn't allow women. And in fact, if we look at the New Testament itself, we can see women in every role except for lead pastor. That's kind of a big deal. And we brings us to the conclusion that we may want to start rethinking things. Um, they didn't have the idea of the church being a place. They didn't have the idea of you can take off your Christian hat. You were the church, and so if Priscilla did it outside of their meeting place, it would have been equivalent to her doing it inside the meeting place. In the modern world, we have compartments. 
Okay, we have Sunday's my day I get up and go to church. Monday's my day that I, you know, go to work. Thursday is my day that I go out and drink. We have our little compartments, and Paul did not teach that at all. That's a modern concept. They didn't have the clear line between church and home that we now have. They didn't have the clear line between, um, you know, when I'm at church, I act like this. But when I'm at home, I act like this. So basically, you're two-faced. Well, they didn't have that idea back then. So you're inserting your own poor theology where it didn't exist. So that takes us to the last thing that I want to say. Paul clearly says that we are no longer slave or free, Jew or gentle man or woman. Now, what did he mean? Did he mean we lose our traits? Well, no, obviously, you can tell my skin is white, and you can tell that I'm a man. So obviously, we don't literally transform out of this, but he's saying in the context of salvation, in the resurrection, for instance, we won't be um, African American or Caucasian or Hispanic. We won't be that. That ends with us when we die. In the resurrected body, we won't have that. Um, we also won't, won't function in the same structure as man or woman there. So we have a big problem there. But what he's saying is what was lost at creation is going is being restored. Now, when in the New Testament, when they when they quote a passage of the Old Testament, they're quoting the whole section, but they only emphasize one or two lines from that whole section. Um, that's how people did it. To quote in, in ancient literature of the time, when you quoted a, a passage of a story, you were quoting that whole section of the story. So if you look at the context, what, what did he quote? He quoted the time when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. Well, in that story is the part where God says in Genesis 3.16, because of this, there's going to be conflict between the husband and wife. However, you're going to go along with it because you're going to desire him. So there's going to be something inside of you that desires to be, to be in a relationship. There's something inside of you that desires to be in a relationship. But there's going to be conflict in that relationship because of sin. So what Paul is saying is, in the whereas sin brought conflict, Jesus in salvation brings a resolution to that conflict. Now, does that mean we don't have roles anymore? Well, we know that the slave still has to be a slave. Now, let me let me kind of clarify. I can see how I might be misunderstood. At that time, Paul was not starting a revolution, okay? So remember back then, at that time, Paul told the slaves how they should act and how the masters how they should act. So now that we've said that, the slaves were still expected, the, the Christian slaves were still expected to serve their, ma their Christian masters. He wasn't, he wasn't demanding for, for a, a revolution. Now, however, however, there were implications that in the future that would no longer exist. And in the future, we could progress past the standard of what was at the time. But Paul wrote to the culture that actually existed, not to the culture that he wished existed. So now that I've said that, um, so slaves still had to do that. The free still had to do that. Uh, Jews were still had their whole family thing going on there, and Gentiles still had their whole thing. And you know, men in that culture still had their roles, and women in that culture still had their own roles. And, but he's talking more about quality. There is restoration now, whereas before the law was given to the Jews. Now we've been grafted in, Jew and Gentile. There's no difference. We are all saved if we believe in Jesus. Now, um, some of us are born into poverty and some of us are born rich, but there's no difference in God's kingdom. So then we can take that and say, okay, now man and woman, there's no difference in that. In that. We are man or woman, and we obviously, woman, women, the Gnostics had this idea that, you know, one sex had to transform into the other sex. Grow, just no, that's not what he's saying. Obviously, but he's saying restoration. Now, there is restoration. So, I hope that that makes sense. I hope that you understand everything that I'm saying. Um, I know I kind of cut off there at the end. I'm kind of going a little bit long. I think that it's kind of clear. So, if you have any questions, please post them below. And please do not just post mean and stupid stuff below. I am not concerned about tradition. I'm not concerned about any of that nonsense. I'm concerned with discovering what God's word has to say to us. And I think that I've made a pretty good argument for this passage being...